eventually is fatal to the idea that, you know, the hierarchy must be preserved. I think that's just a sign that there's so many people in this country. When things can get that obviously irrational, yeah. that there's just no intellectual self-defense, there's no one left to form, you know, a sentence, let alone a paragraph, let alone have the power to get it printed in front of millions of people anymore. And that's what I noticed. And no editor would dare print it anyway for fear the ads would dry up. Senator Oscar Calloway <clears throat> in 1917 addressed the Congress and he said that the J.P. Morgan interest, the shipbuilding powder interest had all gotten together and bought the top, edit you know, they, it, they placed editors yeah. at the top 25 newspapers in order to control the content on political policy and military policy. So that was really the declaration, the first origins of the Council on Foreign Relations, which goal is to kind of control and, and mold the minds of the masses using official experts and historians. and So these other clues won't leak. Huh? How about Harry Truman's speech before the U.S. Senate in 1942 denouncing the Rockefeller interests as traitors because they were selling oil to both sides. What he didn't know was that the Krupp cannon makers were doing the same thing, making the German cannon, selling them to the French or anyone else who would buy them. Uh, they had already become a virtual global society. But uh, to Truman's denunciation of the Rockefellers on the floor of the Senate, you would think that would be just elementary sharing with generations of school kids. No, doesn't exist for all practical purposes, unless you're willing to sit in the, well, my generation, sit in the library stacks and go through. I did that in Columbia. I said, I'm going to find out Oh, now I'm going back to 1958. So I got a stack pass. I've never, I've heard about stack pass. I'm down like in the sixth level. There's these huge stacks of popular magazines. That, you know, I'm interested to find out what the popular newspapers and magazines said about the Second World War before it started for like the 90 days before it started, let me tell you, to a publication, there not only was a certainty there was going to be war, but no worry at all. They all agreed that there was no ability on the part of any potential enemy to sustain a war, that all the gains would be right away, then they couldn't replace their losses. I noted that Quigley said not only did the British start the war with a larger air force than the Germans and more advanced technologically, but they could replace their losses and the Germans couldn't and the Japs couldn't at all. So they ended the war with the same plane they began the war with. Well, this was understood before we had a war. This is a good way to get out of the depression. Good way to cow dissidents in the population always is to declare a national emergency. Then you have an excuse for foreclosing freedom of speech. What did Quigley do that was so unique or remarkable that no one else had done before? Well, what Carol Quigley, the head of the Foreign Service Department at Georgetown University, no marginal school. What he did was use his invitation to be the only human being ever invited to view the files of the Council on Foreign Relations, and I believe its predecessor also. What he did was to actually write a major piece of nonfiction. Must be 1,300 words long, uh, pages long fairly small print, and he made the fatal mistake of being a superb writer and thinker so that it's accessible to anyone who gets a hold of a copy of the book. That was quite impossible beginning 
six months after the book was published, and I can just see the manuscript must have been this big. So an editor uh, asked to vet the thing and make sure, yeah, 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 and after all, Georgetown, this guy's safe. Out it goes, Macmillan publishes it, sells out instantly, instantly. And any conspiracy theory you've ever heard of is documented, only not as a conspiracy theory. Gives you the name, the date, the time, the actual letters. Oh, good God. Well, somebody got hung for that. Macmillan broke the plates, told Quigley there was no interest in the book at all, broke the plate so it couldn't be reprinted. Quigley's on a tape recording right at the end of his life that's stored down in Georgetown in the stack saying that they lied to him, that they had tons of who wouldn't want to read the book. I spent six months looking for a copy of the book and finally found one in in the rare book room at New York University and had it stolen. And then a couple of months later, because I'd looked in so many cities, I got a call, mysterious call from a fellow. I think he turned out to be a dentist, had a radio show. Who he is. Okay. It's Stan Monteith. Yes, yeah, Stan Monteith. He said, I understand you're looking for, uh, well, I said, do you know where, yes, he said, I have some copies. Of course, he had reprinted the copies. And after Monteith, over the next couple of years, several other people had taken the, uh, the, uh, the, the Macmillan and reprinted it so much, in fact, that it became the basis for a growing number of aware people. They weren't sure what they were aware of, other than that the story was not as delivered, not, not in junior high and not at Harvard. It was a different story. It was a story that could accommodate two fraternity brothers at Yale running against one another for president. The big agenda. But, but Quigley's real gift to the rest of us is his absolute mastery of prose and his really interesting mind and his confession that he agreed with the plot. He simply, as a good Roman Catholic, didn't apply it with the secrecy. He said, I believe there's nothing anyone can do about this anyway. It was marvelous. I go back whenever I feel despair. And not an easy, I mean, it's an easy read because it's so well written, but it's a big chunk. He says, for example, that the only times liberties ever appeared in human society is when the population is privately armed with deadly weapons. And to reach the acme of liberty, they have to have the same weapons available to them that the government has available to them. And yet we're not talking about some guy who rolls his car up. We're talking about this internationally famous scholar. So, Well, at the beginning, you know, the American Revolution, uh, the, the people who were fighting against the British government had equal arms. You know, they were landowners. They had, sure. they had interest to fight over it. That stopped being equal in the 1930s with mechanized warfare and mass production because they've had Prussian education in place for 80 years and now everyone's an obedient worker and Amtsprache allows a lot of people to do things that they normally wouldn't do but now it's part of their job and now it's their responsibility and now it's their duty and all the things that Milgram drove home through his experiments look these people will kill other people if you put a white coat on yes yes well <laughs> It's quite exciting. I mean, it's, it's a hideous 
turn in human history, but it's quite exciting. The comprehensive surveillance mechanism. What you can do is suppress that activity, but you can't do it and say, we're, this is a free society and we're all in the game together. There are four copies, I think, of Tragedy and Hope around. Have you seen the, the first edition? I have, and I'm wondering when Macmillan has been forced to reprint it very recently, in the last year or two. And I'm wondering, and you don't have to delete key sections, still be a big book, uh, to take the real sting out of it. I thought somebody with young eyes, a lot of stamina, ought to sit with the original edition and the reprint just to make sure. So we're doing tomorrow afternoon. We have a first edition and we have several other reprints and we're gonna... Oh, do let me know. Because I have other people I'm trying to see the idea and I could say there's the project's underway and want you send them a little check. And, you know. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think about Quigley's book, Anglo-American Establishment?